let's jump into chapter 7. It deals with exergy analysis. So what we're going to learn is that there's a new property called exergy, and it's for a system. What other properties do we already know of? Enthalpy is one. Which one? Entropy, uh, yes. So entropy, your internal energy, specific volume. The easiest ones you miss, pressure and temperature. It's, so usually it's pressure, temperature, then you move to the harder ones. But now we have a new property for a system. It's called the exergy. And then we'll have an exergy balance, just like we had an energy balance, for a closed system. And then we'll go and do an exergy balance for an open system. See the pattern? Just like we did in Thermo 1. Uh, but when we go to the exergy for an open system, we find that we need to use something like enthalpy. We have flow exergy. It's analogous to enthalpy, where E is analogous to U, H is analogous to the flow exergy. And then we revisit the efficiency of common components like turbines, pressors, pumps, and heat exchangers. And we have now a new exergetic efficiency. Numerically, it'll be very close to the values of our isentropic efficiencies for those same components, which you studied in Thermo 1. But it's a different, slightly different definition, and it's based on exergy, a different property. So what is energy? So I did this for the 9 o'clock. I gave students about five minutes, and I said, do you have a piece of paper? Can you put your name on it? And can you, in five minutes, give me a definition of energy that's appropriate to a high school level? OK, can you do that for me? I just want to give me your definition of energy, energy at the high school level. On an extra piece of paper, you rip out and turn it into me. All right. So, if you're uh, like a lot of people, if you ask somebody, you know, you have a lot of energy. What does that mean? They usually describe the ability to do something useful, do some useful work. But what we're going to find is that's a great definition of a new property called exergy. Exergy is a capacity to do some useful work, not just work that's busy work, but useful work, productive work. And X energy is, uh, even though you have a whole book and you spend a whole semester studying thermodynamics, it's all about energy. It's forms and transformation between forms, right? And it's limitations of that. Uh, and that's not the first introduction to energy, is it? Energy is a main topic in dynamics, main topics in physics, and other classes, chemistry. So energy is a, a concept that's been introduced and molded over. But it's a lot. It's pretty hard to define. But if you just defined it as something like it's a capacity producing a physical effect. So you could have something hot that has some internal energy. You have something going fast, that's kinetic energy. Something high in elevation, that's potential energy. But it has an ability to have an effect. What would be that effect? Make something else move, make something else go up, make something else get hot or cold. So uh, can you think about this? Here's a question for you after hours. Find the best definition of energy that's in your textbook. Find the best definition, the clearest, crispest definition of energy in the textbook that we're using for this class. See what you come up with, OK? Do you think you would have probably seen that in Thermo 1? Or would they wait and introduce energy in thermal two? No, no, it's it's been already introduced, right? Um, okay. Now it's a energy and entropy as a review. One is conserved, one is not conserved. You have the first law, or an energy balance. We have the second law. It's basically described as an entropy balance. There's many forms of energy: internal, kinetic, potential energy. True. When you think of eternal, you think of something being hot. But it's, if it's a um, steam, it's hot under high pressure. So it's two independent intensive properties help fix the state and determine you. Kinetic, how fast is it going? And then potential, how high is it in an elevated gravitational field? And then not only those three primary forms, but the transformation of energy 
in the form of heat, Q, and work, W, how does heat transfer occur? It only occurs when there is a delta T, a temperature difference. True? And work occurs when you have a force pressure torque with some motion, rotational or translational motion. Okay? That's how you get work, that energy transfer with work. Now, when you go to the second law, it's all about the quality of energy. And we found that some energy can be easily converted to another form, but some other forms cannot be easily converted or readily converted or even 100% converted to another form. So that's all about the quality of energy. In the quality scheme, work is high. Kinetic energy is high. Potential energy is high. Internal energy is lower. It's a lower quality because you can't convert all of the internal energy into kinetic or potential energy. This internal to kinetic is hard, and it can't be done 100%. But you can convert all of the kinetic into internal friction or all the potential into an internal. That's relatively easy if you understand that terminology. It's not limited in that direction of transfer. But internal to kinetic or internal to potential are hard. Work in the heat, easy. Heat in the work, hard and limited by the second law of thermodynamics. So exergy, we'll get more on the definition, is a maximum theoretical work obtained. When you have a system, and it comes or goes into equilibrium with the environment. Some cleverly designed system to take a hot, high pressure, high kinetic energy, high potential energy system and convert it or tr make it transform through a process into its in equilibrium with the environment. And during that process, do as much useful work out. Turn a shaft to raise a weight in a gravitational field lift something, do useful work. Okay, so the exergy depends on the state of the system as well as the state of the environment because it's going to go from the current state of the system to mechanical and thermal equilibrium with the environment. What does it mean when it's at equilibrium with the environment? It means that basically now the system's at a dead state. It has no more potential to do useful work because it's no temperature difference to exploit and no force imbalance to exploit in order, in order to do useful work. So thermal equilibrium, they have the same temperature. Mechanical equilibrium, they have the same pressure. And at the dead state, there's no more useful, no more capacity to do useful work. Often the dead state pressure, P0, is 1 atm, but they could change it to be 100 kilopascal. That's not precisely the same as 1 atm, but it's very close. And the dead state temperature, 25 degrees C, or they could change it to 300 Kelvin, very close in temperature. So you have to read the problems. Usually those are given in problem statements. Without deriving it, the uh, energy and the enthalpy, or you're, you're already introduced to, energy for a closed system, the sum of internal kinetic potential, and then enthalpy is internal and the PV, which is a flow work term. For exergy, this is the exergy of the system. We'll get to the flow exergy later. But take a look at that equation. You have U, that's the internal energy of the system at its current state, minus what is U naught? Well, what was T naught? The dead state temperature, 25C. What was P naught? the environment pressure that the system gets to, and then it's one bar or one ATM, right? So this is the internal energy of the system when it is in thermal equilibrium with the environment. So it's you evaluated at temperature T naught and P naught pressure. Likewise, it's P naught times V minus V naught. What is this V? Well, it's the same as this, U. It's the internal energy to begin with, it's the vo volume to begin with, and it's the entropy to begin with compared to what is the internal energy of the system when it's finally in equilibrium with the environment, the volume of the system when it's in equilibrium with the environment, and the entropy of the system when it's in equilibrium with the environment, when it's reached its dead state. Can't do any more useful work. 
Now you add in it its original kinetic and potential energy, and that is the exergy of the system. We didn't drive it, did we? Let's solve the problem. We have water. They give us temperature and pressure. So a system consists of five kilograms of water at a temperature of 160 degrees C and a pressure of 1.5 bar. Okay. The system is at rest, so the kinetic energy is zero. And zero elevation, so the potential energy is zero. In a reference environment at which the dead state temperature, T naught, is 20 degrees C. And P naught is one bar. So I've just summarized the information given. Determine now the exergy of the system in units of kilojoule. Notice the units of exergy. They're the same units as energy, and internal energy, same units, right? It's same units. It's a little confusing. But how do, you, when I, how do I distinguish when I see an E? Does that E mean energy or exergy? The book says look at the context. It's just like when you see V. Even I think I tripped on this one a little bit. I was saying this V minus V naught. I think I started to say velocity. But it's not V for velocity, it's V for volume. You, so you have to pay attention, that's all. So what equation do we use? We use the equation that was on the previous page. The exergy is the mass times U minus U naught plus P naught V minus V naught plus, oops, minus T naught S minus S naught plus lowercase k e plus lowercase p e, close bracket. What is the potential in kinetic? Zero. They're given in the problem statement, true? So what I have to do is I have to come over here and I have to say, can I find, can I find u at this temperature and pressure? A good review of thermal one. Water at that temperature and pressure, give me the internal energy. Can I find the specific volume? Because I need it here, I need it here, and then I need it here. Can I find the entropy at the given temperature and pressure? All right. Then I need U naught, which is U at T naught, P naught. Just look up in the tables to get U naught. V naught and S naught, the same thing. So you just look up, stick in, look up, stick in, look up, stick in. Then look up, stick in, look up, stick in, look up, stick in. What do I put here for P naught? I put in the, the one bar, which is 100 kilopascal, because when I have units, I'm going to have a kilopascal. Oops, let me write that right. Check the units on this middle group of terms. Kilopascal times a meter cubed over a kilogram, right? I want to remember a convenient conversion factor that one kilojoule is a kilopascal times a meter cubed. Is that a, do you remember that conversion factor? So kilopascals go, meters cubed go, I've got kilojoules per kilogram. Likewise for entropy, you just, the units work out. I have to have T naught, don't put in 20 degrees C, look at the units of S. S has units of kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, not degree C, right? So when we put in T naught, what value do I put in here? 293 Kelvin. That's exactly right. I need to put 293 Kelvin. Professor, what about, I thought it was 273.15. Okay, good. Now you have it good to five significant digits. And you can put it to five significant digits. And sometimes you should put it to five significant digits, but most of the time it's three on temperature conversion is good enough, isn't it? All right. And then you can make that computation. I'm sorry I ran out of time.